Besides actually playing the game, one of the most time consuming things you might do in D&D is gonna be creating your character. But if you've never created one before, it can be a little bit of a daunting process. I mean, there's a lot on the character sheet. You know, things like race, class, abilities, proficiencies, equipment, background. How, where did all those numbers come from? What the hell's AC? So today we're going to go over the complete character creation process. So if you've never made a character before, grab a character sheet, follow along as I go through it step by step. Now, when you're first creating your character, two important decisions will be your character's race and the character's class. When we're talking about race, it's slightly less important compared to class when it comes to designing your character, but it's still an important part. You want to be a human, orc, tiefling, goliath, elf. There's a lot of different choices, and some of them might depend on the world you're playing in, too. So definitely something you want to talk to your DM about. Really, throughout this whole process, you should be working closely with your DM when you're creating a character, especially for a long-term campaign, because your character choice can influence and can also be influenced by other characters' choices in addition to the whole world and campaign itself. Your character's race can have some uh, impacts on ability scores also. So as an example of what I mean, if we look at the player's handbook, we can see that a dragonborn will have their strength increased by two and charisma increased by one. A dwarf would get a plus two to their constitution. So examples of how, how the different races can impact your ability scores. Different races can also give other benefits or other abilities also. A good example of that would be elven races, dwarves, gnomes, and several other characters that would get dark vision, which is the ability to see up to 60 feet in dark conditions with some other clarifiers. Uh, halflings get an ability called luck, which lets them re-roll ones on things like attacks and ability checks. So you can see where a lot of different races can provide a lot of different benefits as well. It's really all about what type of character you want to play, and that's something that your DM or another experienced player can help you decide. It can vary a lot based on the setting for the game as well. So let's talk about our classes now. Your character's class determines a lot of things like what kind of skills they'll have, how they'll attack in combat, things like that. So do you want to play someone who runs into the middle of a fight and can take a beating while dishing one out also? Or do you want to play someone who stays a little bit further away from the action but rains down damage from a distance? Or maybe you're interested in playing something like a spellcaster, like a wizard or a sorcerer. Or maybe you want to play a sneaky rogue who hides in the shadows and picks locks and pockets with ease. Or maybe you're more interested in being like a support class, healing your allies, identifying mysterious potions, things like that. So really the first thing you should ask yourself here is what type of character appeals to you the most, which is really something, again, you want to work with your DM on, especially if you're not quite sure yet. So for our character here, I'm going to build during this video, I'm going to build a half elf wizard. Again, keep in mind, each class and race combination is going to have different abilities. There's absolutely no way I can cover all of those in a single video and keep it anything short of seven hours. If you have a specific combo you'd like to see me build, let me know down in the comments, or you can drop by our Discord server as well. The link to that is in the description. And while you're at it, it'd be great if you would, you know, give this video a like and subscribe if you aren't already. The way you build your character is almost always going to be a personal choice in how you want to do it. There's going to be some influence from the gameplay style and the setting of the game, but when it comes down to it, the character you build is your choice. Nothing here about your character is going to be set in stone either, especially before you start playing. If you create a character and you're just not happy with it, fine. Build another one. Keep the first one in your back pocket. Maybe someday you will want to try playing with them. That's one thing you'll come to notice about D&D is if you can't or don't want to use something right now, save it, and there's a really good chance 
you'll be able to find another opportunity for it later down the road. So before we go any further, let's take a quick look at the character sheet. So you're familiar with uh, what everything is on there, and we'll get back to actually building our character. So starting at the top here, we've got the character's name, their class, level, race, background, alignment, all that good stuff, along with your name uh, and how much XP or experience points your character is going to have. Your DM is usually going to tell you the experience point part of it. Moving over to the left side of the sheet, we have our section where you find all your character's primary ability scores and their modifiers. One thing to keep in mind here, there's a few different variations of a character sheet's design here. So what you see on the screen here might not be exactly the same thing used down the road, but this is the official one from Wizards of the Coast. It's so moving over to the right now and starting at the top here, we've got a box that shows uh, whether or not our character is going to have inspiration, something your DM will tell you while you're playing. We go down and see our proficiency bonus, which that changes as we level up. That's a modifier that you'll add to roles for abilities that your character is proficient in. Underneath that, we have our modifiers in saving throws and then an indicator whether your character is proficient in a specific saving throw to the left there. Below all of that, we have all of our individual skill checks and the base ability they relate to in parentheses next to it. Move back up to the top here, we have the middle section that lists our armor class, our initiative, and our speed. Armor class, also known as AC, really comes into play during combat. If Another character is attacking yours, this is the number they need to either hit or beat for the attack to be successful. Uh, initiative is the modifier you're going to add to your role, uh, specifically your initiative role, normally for combat, but can be used for other things as well. And you have your character's speed. That's how far they can move during their turn. Again, mostly for combat. Below this section, all about hit points. You have your maximum hit points, your current hit points, and then temporary hit points, all shown in this section between armor class and uh, you know, death saves. Maximum hit points usually only going to increase as you level up though. The bottom row of this section here in the middle is for your hit dice and death saves. Hit dice correspond to the die you roll when you level up to either increase your maximum hit points, or the die you roll during a short rest to regain some HP. Usually it'll list out the die like a D8 or a D10 and then the number of hit dice you have available to roll per long rest. And then you have your death saves. If you're rolling these, your character's already unconscious. Death saves are rolled to determine whether your character stabilizes or dies after falling unconscious, normally because of an attack or something similar like that. The way it works is you roll a d20. If it's below 10, it's a failure. If it's 10 or higher, it's a success. If you have three successes, your character stabilizes and is no longer in immediate danger of dying. If you roll three failures, your character is dead. Now, keep in mind, these failures and successes do not need to be in succession. You could roll one success and then two failures and then one more success and then another failure, which is three failures. Your character's still dead, even though they weren't in succession. And below that, you have a section where you can fill in uh, available attacks and prepared spells depending on your class. Your class may or may not have spells. You can list the uh, things like attack name, something like a short sword or a mace or a bow, uh, the attack bonus, which is calculated based on the type of attack it is and your proficiency modifier as well, and the type of damage the attack deals plus which die or dice are used to roll that damage. And then underneath that section is one to track your currency from copper pieces all the way up to platinum pieces. This is also where you will add your most used 
equipment as well, you'll usually need more space for that. So moving on to the right hand side, this is all about your role play information here. What type of personality does your character have? What are their ideals, their bonds, their flaws? And then any other features or traits, things like allies, physical description, really whatever information you want to put in there. This is just the basic first sheet for a character. There are other sheets you can use in addition. They're not necessarily required to play depending on the class you're playing. So I'm not really gonna cover them here. This one is the most important. So next up for our character build after we've decided on our race and our class is our abilities. These are what determines your character's primary attributes, how strong your character is gonna be, how well they can avoid obstacles or climb over things, how many hit points they have, things like that. There's two numbers associated with each of your character's abilities, the score itself and the modifier. The score is what you choose or roll or generate when you create your character. The modifier is calculated from the score. When you roll a skill check or an attack or something like that, the modifier is what you add to the roll. But to give you an example, if you have a dexterity, say, of uh, 10, the modifier for that is going to be a zero, meaning you don't add or subtract anything when you roll for a dexterity-based roll. Now, from that baseline of 10, the modifier is going to either increase or decrease based on the score. So if you have a modifier of, or excuse me, if you have a score of an 11 or 12, your modifier becomes a plus one. A score of a 13 or a 14, your modifier is a plus two, and so on for every two points that your score goes up. Now, on the opposite side of that, a score of a nine or an eight gives you a modifier of a negative one, a score of a seven or a six gives you a modifier of a negative two, and then on down the line, similar to the increases. We'll see this in more detail once we have our character sheet actually filled out. So let's talk about what these abilities actually are so you can really have a better idea of how you might wanna allocate them for your character. There are six abilities your character has, strength, dexterity, constitution, intelligence, wisdom, and charisma. Let's start with strength. According to the player's handbook, which is where I'm gonna pull all these descriptions from, strength is a measure of your character's natural athleticism and bodily power. Basically how physically strong your character is. Dexterity measures your character's physical agility, their reflexes, poise, balance, things like that. Basically how well your character can move around, dodge obstacles, avoid triggered traps, things like that. You have constitution. That represents your character's level of health, stamina, and vital force. Constitution has a direct impact on how many hit points your character gets each time they level up also. Your intelligence measures how well your character can recall information, their mental acuity and their analytical skills, basically your character's book smarts. You have wisdom, that represents things like intuition, insight, your character's awareness of their surroundings, how quickly they might be able to notice something happening around them or how well they could tell if someone is maybe trying to hide something from them or lie to them. You have charisma, that's how confident your character is. Their eloquence when speaking with others and their leadership abilities. Charisma can really come in handy when you're trying to barter or negotiate with merchants or when you're maybe trying to deceive another character, whether that's an NPC or maybe somebody in your own party. So now we have a better idea of what a character's abilities actually are. How do you get these scores? How do you determine what your character's scores are? There are three main ways you can do that. Which one you use is usually going to be up to your DM, so definitely consult with them first. The method I prefer to use when I'm running games is you roll some dice for all your scores. You take four D6 or four six-sided dice, roll them all at the same time, drop the lowest number, and then add up the highest three. So if you rolled a three five, two, and a six. You drop that two and get a total of 14. You do that five more times so at the end you have six numbers total. 
You take those six numbers, and based on how you want to build your character, you assign each one to a specific ability. Depending on your class, there's normally one specific ability you want to give the highest score to. Now, if you use this method, you definitely have the possibility of getting some really good scores, but also some really bad scores too. You might have the option of re-rolling those, but again, work with your DM on this. But something to think about here is sometimes having a slightly low ability score could make for some uh, interesting character quirks and can lead to some entertaining role-playing. Another way you can determine your scores is using what's known as the standard array. For this, you take a standard list of predetermined numbers and then just assign them to your abilities. Those numbers are gonna be eight, 10, 12, 13, 14, and 15. You just pick which score you wanna to assign to each ability and you're done. The third way to generate these scores is using a method known as point by. With this method, you've got 27 points that you can spend to choose your scores. For example, if you want to assign, say, a 15 to one of your scores, that's going to cost you nine points out of that 27. A 10 will cost you two points. I recommend, though, if you use this method, there's a chart. Check that out, a chart in the player's handbook. Definitely check that out. It lists out all the points there. So now, Unless your DM is going to tell you which method to use, which is, like I said earlier, is a very good possibility, you have to decide which one you want to use. If you roll for your scores, they can be all over the place. You've got the possibility of rolling as low as a 3, but also as high as an 18. But with the other two methods, your scores are going to be something between an 8 and a 15. A lot less chance of getting a bad score but also no chance of getting an 18, which is gonna give you a plus four modifier. If you want to leave it more up to chance, which is usually what I like to do, it's more fun, I think, then roll for your scores and see what you get. Remember, if your DM agrees to it, you can always re-roll something if it's really horrible. I once had a character I was creating and I somehow managed to roll four of my ability scores, four out of six scores, under a 10, and one of them actually was a three. It was the only time I've ever rolled a three for ability scores. Thankfully, I had a very understanding DM at the time, so he let me re-roll everything. Let's go ahead and roll for our wizard's ability scores and start building out that character sheet. Since we're building a half-elf here, we actually get a plus two on our charisma and a plus one to two other scores that we get to choose. We'll add those bonuses in at the end. Now, for the purposes of this video, I'm going to use a virtual tabletop to roll my scores, but you can roll, you can use whatever method you use. You can use actual dice, an online dice roller, or anything else. Or you can use one of the other two methods to generate your scores, the standard array or the point by. On our virtual tabletop now, let's go ahead and roll for those ability scores. Remember, we are rolling 4d6, dropping the lowest one and adding the three remaining die together. So let's see what we get for those rolls. Our first one is two fives, a three, and a six. We drop that three and we get a 16, a really good roll to start us off. Our second roll is a two, a three, a five, and a six. Drop that two and that gives us a 14, another good roll. Let's see what our third roll is. For our third one, we get a two, three, five, and six. Drop the two again, and we get a 14. Two in a row now. Let's see what our fourth roll is going to come out to be. Two sixes, a three, and a five. We'll drop that three, and we'll get a 17. We're getting some impressive rolls. I promise I did not rig anything. Our fifth roll is going to be two fives, a two, and a six. We drop that two and we get a 16. These are incredibly high rolls, just so you know. And our final roll, we get two twos, a three, and a six. Not a high roll. Drop one of those twos, it gives us an 11. So we end up with a 16, a 14, another 14, a 17, another 16, and an 11. A really, really good set of rolls for our character. Next step is to assign these ability scores we just rolled to whatever abilities we want to put them on for our character. 
Two things to keep in mind before you start assigning your ability scores is one, what is your character's primary ability? What do they need to be the strongest in to be the most effective character they can be? And number two, what bonuses do you have available? For our character here, the half-elf wizard, our most important ability is gonna be intelligence. So we wanna assign the highest number to intelligence. Because we're a half-elf, we also get plus two to our charisma score, and then we get to pick two other ability scores to add plus one to. Now remember, your modifiers only increase in increments of two. So if you say have an 11 to one of your scores, you still have a plus zero there. But if you get a plus one, you can add the plus one to that to get a 12 and your modifier then becomes a plus one instead of a zero. So let's see what we're gonna pick out for our character here. Again, because intelligence is our most important ability for a wizard, we're gonna choose our highest number that we rolled, 17. And then we're gonna take one of our plus ones that we get, add it to the 17, and assign our intelligence as an 18. That gives us a plus four to that modifier, which is really good for a level one character. The next most important ability for our character here is gonna be our constitution. Constitution ties in directly to how many hit points you start out with at level one, and how many hit points you get as you level up each level. So we're gonna pick our next highest score that we rolled, a 16, and assign it to our constitution. Adding one here for our other bonus that we get doesn't make any sense because it wouldn't increase our modifier at all. We're gonna set our constitution the 16, which gets us a plus three there. Our other 16, we're gonna to assign to wisdom. And we're starting to get into more of our abilities that will kind of depict how we want to play our character. They're gonna be less important for the actual mechanics of our character and more of how do we wanna flavor this character, if you will. So we'll assign our 16 to our wisdom. And then I'm gonna make this a bit of a charismatic wizard as well. And remember, as a half elf, we get a plus two there. So I'm gonna take one of our 14s and assign that to our charisma score give the plus two to it, so our charisma score then becomes a 16, so another plus three modifier for our charisma. We have a 14 and an 11 left at this point. I'm gonna make the stereotypical, somewhat weak wizard, so I'm gonna assign the 11 to our strength, and here's where I'm gonna use the other plus one to get that an 11 to a 12 and give us a plus one for our strength. Not a terribly weak wizard, but still not the strongest in the world. And then our last ability score that we rolled is a 14. I'm gonna assign that to dexterity because that's all that's left in this case. So that is kind of the reasoning behind why I picked out what scores for this wizard. Now there's two other items on our character sheet these ability scores tie directly into right now. Our first one is gonna be our initiative score. That is what we get to add to the roll most of the time for when we're starting combat to determine what order all of the characters go in. Your initiative modifier ties directly into what your dexterity modifier is. So for our character here, our dexterity score is a 14, gives us a modifier of a plus two, so our initiative modifier, therefore, is a plus two as well. The other thing our ability score is tied directly into here is going to be our hit points, or HP. Those are tied directly to your constitution score. Now for a wizard, the hit die is a D6. That is the die you roll when it's time to level up your character or when you're taking a short rest and wanna add some hit points if you have a hit die available. For first level, you always take the maximum number for that hit die, plus your constitution modifier. In our case, our constitution score is a 16. That gives us a modifier of a plus three. Six plus three gives us nine hit points at level one. So now that we have our character's race, class, and ability scores picked out, there's a couple more things to look at. First off, where do our character's proficiencies lie? What are they particularly skilled at? Your race and class combination is gonna affect that. Plus, we'll give you some extras you can choose as well. So for our character here, a half-elf gets proficiency in two skills of our choice. And as a wizard, we also get to choose two out of a list of arcana, history, insight, investigation, medicine, or religion. 
As a wizard, their primary job is going to be spellcasting, so we almost always want to choose Arcana as one of them. But the other three are really going to be up to what type of character you want to play. Now, the player's handbook is going to contain all of the information you need to build out a specific class, like our wizard here. This is where I'm getting all of the information from for this character. So in addition to Arcana, I'm also going to choose Investigation as one of the wizard skills we get to be proficient in. One of the reasons I'm choosing that is because Investigation ties directly into our Intelligence score, which is the highest for this character. And when you're proficient in a skill, it allows you to add your proficiency bonus to whatever roles you get. So for Investigation, you add your Intelligence modifier plus your proficiency bonus as for this character, since we're going to be proficient in investigation, which lets us add a plus six to any of our investigation roles. And as the half elf, we get to add two more of our choice. For this character, I'm going to choose animal handling and perception. Part of the reason for that is just the type of character I want to run here. And also animal handling and perception are both wisdom based skills. So we have high scores in wisdom as well. Our wisdom score here is a 16. That gives us a plus three modifier to wisdom. So our animal handling and perception checks will be able to add a plus five, that plus three for wisdom and our plus two for our proficiency modifier. For our languages, we get common and elvish and we get to pick a third that our character is proficient. You might want to check with your DM to see what languages are available in your game setting, and also take a look at the player's handbook to see a good starter list too. But for our wizard here, I'm going to choose Draconic for his third language. Now, our weapons and our armor are based off of our class. As a wizard, our character is proficient with daggers, darts, slings, quarterstaffs, and light crossbows as the weapons. Being proficient with a weapon lets you add your proficiency modifier to any attack rolls with that weapon, in addition to whatever the appropriate ability modifier is for the whatever attack it is. So we're going to start off with either a quarterstaff or a dagger as our weapon for our choices here. I'm going to choose a quarterstaff. Now, wizards don't have proficiency with any armor. They usually do tend to be unarmed. Armor is going to add to your armor class, your AC score again. And this is what you use to determine whether an attack against your character is going to hit or not. And then finally, since our character is a spellcaster, we need to add spells. Each class has their own list of spells, and those lists can definitely be a little long depending on what class you're looking at. So in the interest of keeping this video a reasonable length, I'm not going to go over selecting spells right now, but if you're interested in seeing a video for a particular spellcasting class's options, Leave a comment down below and I can cover that in a future video. So for now, just know that your spells are going to be divided into specific levels, starting with cantrips and then level one through nine spells. Spellcasters can only cast a certain number of spells each day, basically until a long rest, based on what level the spell is. Now, for example, a first level wizard can cast two first level spells per day. Now, the exception to that rule is cantrips. Cantrips are usually simpler spells, usually either just have a cosmetic purpose or some other minor effect. Usually, there are exceptions. There are cantrips that can be a little more powerful depending on your class. Though. Cantrips, though, can be cast as many times a day as you want. There's no limit on them. As a first level wizard, we know three cantrip spells that can be cast whenever, assuming we have the necessary components for the spell. Now, as a spellcaster levels up, they get additional spell slots. A wizard can cast three first level spells at level two, and then at level three, they get to use second level spells as well, all the way up through level nine spells. And those are the most powerful in the game and can have some pretty massive effects as well. For the most part, most spellcasters will actually get your level nine spells at character level 17. So let's take a look at our finished character sheet now. Starting at the top, we've got our class and level filled in, got my name filled in, our character's race. Haven't quite filled in background or alignment yet since those are a little specific to role playing and not really something we're covering in depth in this video. But moving down, looking at the left hand side here, we've got all of our ability scores filled in, which we've gone over previously. 
We've got our armor class at the top. Now, armor class, we didn't talk about yet. That, if you are not wearing armor, that starts out at a base score of 10 plus whatever your dexterity modifier is. So in the case of our wizard here, that is going to be a 12. Our dexterity modifier is 2. 10 plus 2, 12. We've got our initiative modifier, our character speed, which comes from the player's handbook, our hit points, our hit dice listed below, and then we have our saving throws, which the proficiency in our saving throws, that comes from the description or the characteristics of the character itself. Again, something that is listed in the player handbook for whatever character, race, and class you are looking at. Our scores for our saving throws come directly from the modifiers for our ability scores, and the ones we're proficient in, the ones that have the dots next to it, we add our proficiency modifier, or proficiency bonus, to the modifier for that ability score. So for intelligence, we get the four plus our proficiency bonus of a plus two, so a total of six, and then wisdom gets bumped up to a five. And the same goes for all of our skills down below. We previously selected proficiency with animal handling, arcana, investigation, and perception. So you see next to the list of what the skill is, acrobatics, animal handling, and so on, you can see to the side there, it tells you specifically what ability it ties to. So you take the modifier for that ability, the proficiency bonus, if you're proficient in the skill, Add that together, and that is the modifier for that particular skill. So for animal handling, we have the plus five. Something like deception, which is a charisma-based skill, we don't have proficiency in that. So we take our charisma modifier, which is a plus three, and it just goes straight into our deception skill there. That's how you fill out and add in all of these skills. Previously said I was going to use a quarter staff for the weapon of choice for this wizard. And you can see here in the attacks and spellcasting section, I've got a quarter staff, the attack bonus listed, and the damage die and type of damage. Now you see for damage die and type, we have a 1d6 and a 1d8. The reason for that is because this is what's known as a versatile weapon. You can attack with it one-handed or two-handed. One-handed gives you 1d6 worth of damage, Two-handed gives you 1d8 worth of damage. All this information is in the D&D rules, the player's handbook, and resources you can find online as well. Scrolling down to take a look at the rest of our sheet here, we have added in our proficiencies in our language. Because we are a half-elf, we do have dark vision, the ability to see in darker circumstances up to a certain amount of distance. Uh, we also have advantage on saving throws against being charmed. And magic cannot put us to sleep. These are characteristics of being a half-elf. We get common and elvish as our languages by default, and then we chose draconic to add in as our third language. And then we have our proficiency with all the weapons that were stated as well. We do not have any armor proficiencies as a wizard. And then our equipment, which again, is listed out what you get as equipment for each type of class is listed in the player's handbook as well. So we didn't get into features and traits and the characteristics, the extra characteristics of our character in, that, in this video, just because that is going to be way too much to cover. So, but here is our mostly completed character sheet for this half-elf wizard. We've got all of our abilities filled in now. We've got our hit points. We have our AC. We've got our equipment added in. Everything is done. Character creation does have several more aspects than I've covered here. Things like your character's background and your backstory, physical characteristics of your character, personality traits, and a few more things. For the most part though, those are gonna be based mainly around role playing and are very specific to your individual character and the story you want to create for them. Your background is going to answer questions like, where did your character come from? What was their earlier life like? What have they been doing with their life until this point? Do they happen to know anyone else in the party, either as allies or as enemies? And your traits, those are going to deal with characteristics of your character, how they might react to certain types of situations, or how they might react towards others. These can help guide how you might want to play your character, or you can choose them based on how you've already decided you want to play your character. 
just depends on how you want to do it. So this about wraps up this video for now. Again, if there's anything else you'd like to see me cover related to character creation, or if you have any questions about the character creation process itself, drop a comment down below. And don't forget to join us in our Discord server as well. If you're looking for some one-on-one -on -one help with working on anything D&D related, be sure to also check out our Patreon page as well. Link to that is in the description. So I really hope this has helped you get a better understanding of the character creation process and hopefully clears uh, a few things up for you as well. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.